Hey, what's going on, everyone? Good Mike Work Commentaries back at you with yet another Patreon-sponsored review. And I'm sure this will not come as a surprise to many of you to learn that we've got our good friend Barry MK to thank for this one again. He has donated to have many reviews done throughout the years. He's been one of the best supporters we have had on this channel. And he has selected a doozy of a show to review today. I'm so glad that he picked this one because we have not talked a whole lot about 2004 on my channel throughout the years and Barry would like to have the WWE draft lottery from Monday Night Raw March 22nd 2004 an entire review on that show done this took place eight days after WrestleMania 20 there was a lot going on here in storyline we had three big title matches and a really interesting main event on this show and a huge monumental return and a couple of storyline swerves as well I have not gone back and looked at this show probably since it aired because a lot of this was like me watching it for the first time so this was an interesting time interesting show and Barry thank you so much for donating once again to have one of these reviews done there's a little extra added bonus to this review this is actually being done for Barry's birthday Barry's birthday is this coming Saturday on January 30th this is coming to you of course a couple of days earlier so as you are thanking Barry in the comments below for sponsoring this review make sure you wish him a happy birthday as well and check out his YouTube channel there's a link right at the top of my description if you just scroll down there you'll see a link to his channel he does all sorts of stuff on his channel and he even has a playlist with every single review that I've done for him and that he's donated to have done throughout the years and we've gone through a lot of crazy wacky shows over the years that Barry has had done and uh, this one will be no different so I think we're gonna have a good time taking a look back at this show from 2004 because it was a very interesting time and like I said it's a time period that we haven't spent a ton of time on here on the channel so this should be a lot of fun if for any reason you would like to support the channel and sponsor to have a review of your own done, you can check out my Patreon page. Link is in the description below and all the details for that are outlined there. You can do a $75 live stream review or you can do a $150 full on edited podcast review, whatever you choose. And it can be on any show that you want from any promotion, anytime, anywhere. And this is a pretty good Monday Night Raw. I had a great time watching it last night, making all my notes, and it was so loaded. It amazes me especially when you think about where we are now in 2021 and the state of Monday Night Raw and how we watch these shows every week. They were able to cram so much into such a short amount of time back then. This was when back when Raw was still two hours long, and they had so much going on here. Granted, we had a lot less commercial breaks and things like that back in the day, but my God, the amount of notes I made for this and the amount of stuff that went down in this show was like twice as much that normally goes down on a regular modern day three hour Monday Night Raw. But anyway, I'm not going to waste a ton of time here. I want to get into this review and start talking about this show because it was awesome. Like I said, WWE Monday Night Raw, March 22nd, 2004 from the Joe Louis Arena in Detroit, Michigan. And this would be WWE's big draft lottery show. Now, how they're going to do this is what Vince McMahon is going to explain in the opening here. We immediately go to a shot of Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff face-to-face, -face, backstage, staring at each other. This was so great. Paul Heyman was beaten up the week before, I think, on SmackDown by The Undertaker, so he's got this neck brace on, and he's face-to-face, -face, scowling at Eric Bischoff, and that's when Vince McMahon shows up and gets in between them, puts his arm around them, and just such a great visual to see WWE, WCW, and ECW together anytime this happened, and it happened a lot, where Vince, Paul, and Eric were all in the, in the ring together or in a promo together, and it never didn't blow my mind. It never ceased to amaze me how crazy that visual was of seeing the three of them together in the same place so many times throughout the years on Monday Night Raw. So Vince comes in and he explains the rules to both guys. He said that they will both have six picks each for a grand total of 12 and there will be just a, a big bin of random stars and each GM will pull out one name at a time and whoever they pull out of the other brand's batch that is now the member of their show or the new member of their show so vince explains the rules very clearly and he just when he starts to walk away and then bischoff stops him and he's like you know vince just to just to clarify i just want to make sure that my champion you know chris benoit and you know whoever else they're all safe and they're exempt and vince is like maybe i didn't make myself clear everybody is eligible everybody from the announcers to the commentators even you two are eligible for this draft so the champions aren't safe nobody is safe 
and Bischoff looks a little bit dejected, and that's when we go into the Monday Night Raw intro. And I miss this intro, don't you? The old 2003, 2004 intro, one of my favorite Monday Night Raws after the Attitude Era. Like nothing, nothing beat the Monday Night Raw Attitude Era intros, but this one from 03 and 04, I liked it a lot. Kind of that like heavy metal version or whatever. So they go into that. <clears throat> We open the show with Jr. and King welcoming us to Monday Night Raw, and they also kick it to Michael Cole and Taz, who are at ringside. So they're pretty much treating this like a pay-per-view where they have a Raw announced team and a SmackDown announced team both there to do the work, very much like a pay-per-view. So that was all very cool. And like I said, this was eight days after WrestleMania, one week after the post-WrestleMania Monday Night Raw. So we then get... Eric Bischoff and Paul Heyman coming out to the stage to open the show. They've got the big uh, spinning batches of superstars on each side for each guy to pull from. And SmackDown is going to get the first pick. So Paul Heyman and SmackDown are up first. And he talked about how he talked about his neck brace. And I don't even remember this, but apparently, you know, Undertaker whooped his ass on SmackDown right after returning at WrestleMania 20 and put Paul Heyman in a neck brace. And Heyman said that he would deal with the Undertaker in his own way. And I think we would see a lot of that going on with uh, with The Undertaker on SmackDown. Some weird things happened just a couple of months later. He would bury Paul Bear in the cement, remember, against the Dudley Boys and stuff. So this was probably just the beginning of that beginning to happen. So after Heyman vows revenge on The Undertaker, he reaches in to pull out his very first SmackDown draft pick, and it turns out to be Rene Dupree. <laughs> I forgot about Rene Dupree. Now, Heyman tried to tease this. He goes, wow, it looks like a super group on Raw will be no more. And a lot of they, they would do this throughout the show. They were trying to tease it like it was going to be evolution, like it was going to be evolution that was going to be broken up. So here you think it's going to be Orton or Flair or Batista or Triple H. Turns out to be Rene Dupree instead. Rene Dupree then comes out to the ring. His music hits. He comes out to the stage, goes to the ring, cuts a promo, and he says he will not have his last memory on Monday Night Raw be getting the Stone Cold Stunner from Steve Austin. Now, I don't remember that, but apparently the last time he was on Raw, Austin whipped his ass. So he demands... One final match before he leaves, Bischoff and Heyman actually agree on this, and they say, okay, have at it, whatever you want, and he issues pretty much an open challenge, and Chris Jericho accepts the challenge. Now, Chris Jericho, just the week before at WrestleMania 20, had been betrayed by Trish Stratus and Christian when Trish turned on him, and then they made out in the aisleway and all that. So he had recently been done wrong and also recently turned babyface, and he's pissed. So he comes out there and uh, accepts the challenge from Rene Dupree and does not take very long to beat him and actually beats him in a weird way, just hits him with an insiguri and pins him, and literally that's it. So it didn't take him long to dispose of Rene Dupree, and he was pretty much just, you know, venting his anger from WrestleMania 20, and he's taking that out on the 20-year-old Rene Dupree, or however old he was at the time. I know he was pretty young. After the match, Dupree is pissed. He gets on the microphone and demands respect and starts whining and belly aching, and that's when you hear the glass shatter, and out comes Sheriff Stone Cold Steve Austin on his four-wheeler, comes down to the ring, drives around the ring, gets in the ring, gives Rene the stunner that he so desperately deserves and boots him right out of Monday Night Raw and sends him to SmackDown. And right after that, we get Monday Night Raw's first pick. So now it's going to be Bischoff's turn to pick somebody from the SmackDown pool. And it turns out to be Shelton Benjamin. So they have now officially split up the world's greatest tag team. They cut to Shelton Benjamin in the back. By the way, they have both locker rooms on camera there, Raw and SmackDown. And you see... Shelton Benjamin remove his shirt, give a big remove his uh, SmackDown shirt, give a big hug to Charlie Haas and say goodbye. So that was very, very sad. We go back out to the ring now. We got a one on one match between Kane and Rico. Rico was with Jackie Gata around this point. So she was at ringside with him. Match lasted about 15 seconds long. Kane just choke slammed Rico and pinned him. And he's very irritated as well, because as we know, at WrestleMania, he lost to the returning dead man. So he comes out makes quick work of Rico as he's leaving. He goes up to the stage where Bischoff and Heyman are standing and he threatens both of them. And he says, look, I don't care what you do or who you draft or whatever. If I am on the same show as my brother, there's going to be hell to pay. So Kane is demanding to not be on the same program as The Undertaker, and uh, they better listen to him. He goes ahead and sets off his pyro after that, and he leaves. And now it's time for SmackDown's second pick. And again, 
Paul Heyman did this several times throughout the show, once again teasing that another super group is being split up and you think it's going to be evolution, and it turns out to be Mark Jindrak. So, so far, the first three picks, I think, are kind of like letdowns. They're not huge picks. And Jindrak was a part of, I guess he was teaming with Lance Cade at the time because in the locker room, they show Cade getting up and giving him a hug. And I don't know who was with them, but I guess they were starting to form some sort of a faction there with Jindrak and Cade or whatever. But I don't remember much about that. And uh, sad to see Lance Cade there knowing what would happen to him just a couple of years later. But Mark Jindrak now is a member of the SmackDown brand. And as we always heard, Jindrak was originally supposed to be an evolution before he was bumped for Batista. So you always wonder what would have become of Mark Jindrak and Batista had the original plans gone through. You know, who knows what would have wound up happening to him. But I don't remember Jindrak doing much on SmackDown. You guys can probably fill me in in the, uh, in the comments below on what exactly he did there. I honestly don't remember. And up next, it was time for Raw's second pick. And they pick a woman this time. Turns out to be Nydia. Nydia's backstage in her SmackDown gear. And... She's now drafted to Raw. She comes out to the stage where Bischoff and Heyman are, and she approaches Eric Bischoff, and Bischoff presents her with the Monday Night Raw shirt, and she just decides to put it on right there. Takes off her SmackDown shirt. She's got her bra and her things hanging out and uh, put on a Raw shirt instead. Got a big pop out of the crowd. And Nydia was funny. I always liked Nydia. You know, she was only around for a little while, but she was entertaining. She wasn't bad in the ring. And I liked her. I kind of wish she would have lasted longer. She was pretty hot around this time. So I don't recall either what, why Nydia didn't work out, what happened to her when she was released. And uh, I don't recall all, all of that because it's been so long. But, you know, it was nice to be reminded of her because I always liked her. I thought she was good. So Nydia is now a member of the Raw roster. It's time for SmackDown's third pick next. But before Paul Heyman can make the selection, you hear the Doctor of Thugonomics theme music start to play and John Cena comes out. He cuts one of his world-famous rap promos first and then proceeds to select SmackDown's pick himself, pulling the ball out of the bin and giving it to Paul Heyman and then leaving. And this is where it got a little bit weird because Paul Heyman is like all freaked out about this. He's like, wait a minute, I didn't choose this. This doesn't count. This isn't the real pick. He hasn't even read it yet. It's just random. You're just pulling out any ball. What, who, what matters? What does it matter whose hand reaches in there and pulls it out? But Bischoff is like, no, no, you got to use this one. You got to take this one. So they're arguing with each other. Neither one of them should care this much. Paul Heyman should just be like, yeah, I'll open this one. And for Bischoff to insist that he keeps it. Nope, nope. That's your pick. That's the pick. It's yours. You open it right now and read it. So Paul Heyman says, okay, fine. He opens it up and he kind of looks at it and he smiles and he's like, you're sure. You're sure you want me to read this? You don't want to go back on your word, nothing? And, and Heyman, or Bischoff, excuse me, is like, nope, that's your pick. Read it out loud right now. And that's when Paul Heyman announces that SmackDown's third pick will be Triple H of Evolution. They immediately cut to the backstage Raw locker room where Triple H has just taken a big sip of water. And of course, he spits it out straight ahead instead of up in the air like when he's doing his ring entrances. And Evolution is split up. And I remember watching this that night being like, how are they going to do this? You know, Evolution was on such a roll. I didn't see Triple H going over to SmackDown. Plus, even around this time in 2004, word was out in the dirt sheets that Triple H and the, the Triple H and Stephanie relationship, everybody knew they got married a couple of years before. Everybody knew that Triple H was in the inner circle now and he could pretty much do whatever he wanted. The reign of terror, beating everybody, that sort of thing. So nobody really thought that Triple H was going to work Tuesdays or whenever the hell they filmed SmackDown back then. He was going to be a raw guy. Plus, you wouldn't really break up evolution when they're still riding high at this point. You know what I mean? So I didn't think this would stick. But I was very curious where it was going to go. And seeing Triple H being drafted to SmackDown in 2004 was a pretty big deal. So that was interesting. Everybody's freaking out. Evolution doesn't know what to do. And Bischoff is losing his mind. He has lost his golden goose now. Triple H is what Bischoff put everything into. He gave Triple H anything he wanted. And now his top star is leaving. And he is freaking out. And we get another match before we hear from Bischoff again, but he's definitely pissed. We get Christian taking on Spike Dudley. Spike Dudley actually looked to be in pretty good shape around this time. Looked like he had been working out. He started wrestling without a shirt. 
And he was still very small, like Marco stunt small, but I was happy to see him, you know, kind of look to be in a little bit better shape. And he took the fight to Christian, pulling out all the stops, diving off the top rope onto the floor, doing whatever he can to try to win. But in the end, Christian would, of course, recover and catch him, hit him with the unprettier and win the match. And Jerry Lawler and Jim Ross both spent a lot of time talking about what Christian and Trish did to Chris Jericho at WrestleMania. So it was kind of cool to see Trish out there, the newly turned heel Trish backing up Christian and their whole disgusting deal that they had there. They made out at WrestleMania 20 on the stage and that whole thing. That was pretty funny. We then go back to the stage where Raw is supposed to make their third pick, but Bischoff is still fuming about the last pick, SmackDown scoring Triple H, saying he's not going to stand for it, and he runs out before he makes the pick looking for Vince McMahon. He winds up finding Vince backstage and he's pleading to Vince to not allow him to lose Triple H. Vince basically says like too bad. Paul Heyman then shows up and starts gloating. And he was like, whatever, dude, these are the rules. You knew the rules. There's nothing you can do about it. Paul Heyman decides to propose a really crazy idea where two SmackDown stars would main event Monday Night Raw in a WWE title match. Undisputed champion Eddie Guerrero defending against brand new SmackDown acquisition, Triple H. He proposes this match takes place in the main event. Eric Bischoff says, no way, you can't have two SmackDown people. Main event, a Raw show, it's taboo, it's not done, it's crazy. And Vince is like, you know what, I like crazy and I'm into it. Let's do it, make it happen. Vince agrees. So Paul Heyman is on cloud nine. Bischoff is starting to get really frustrated, but he goes back out to the stage now to finally make Raw's third pick. And I guess as a response to what Heyman was able to get done, having a SmackDown WWE title match in the main event of Raw, Eric Bischoff decides to counter that by saying whoever he picks out of the SmackDown pool, whoever Raw's next pick is, will also get a title shot tonight on Raw against world heavyweight champion Chris Benoit. So whoever he pulls out gets a title shot automatically. Pulls out the ball, opens it up, turns out to be Rhino, hometown boy Rhino, right there in Detroit. And that would be your match, Rhino versus Chris Benoit later on. You guys have to tell me, have we ever had a Monday Night Raw where two world titles are on the line? A world heavyweight and a WWE? I know we've never had a WWE and a Universal, but I don't know if we've had a big gold belt and a WWE title both defended on Raw. That's pretty crazy. This might be the only time they've ever done that, but I also could be wrong. You guys are going to have to let me know in the comments below. The next match we had was the first of three title matches. We also had a tag team title match on Raw as well. Tag team champions Rob Van Dam and Booker T defending against Evolution members Batista and Ric Flair. Now, I remember, I knew Flair and Batista would be champions, and I knew they had to win the belts at some point, and I figured when I was watching this, this was probably it, especially with the draft going on and everything, and Batista and Ric Flair are a little bit discombob right now, because their leader, Triple H, just got drafted to SmackDown, so they're a little bit all over the place, but... They managed to keep it together here and have this tag team title match with Booker T and RVD, a team that I was never really that big of a fan of. Seems like they always kind of stuck Booker with people. I like Booker's alliance and tag team with Goldust, but the Rob Van Dam one seemed a little bit on the random side, and I wasn't really a huge fan of them being together and being tag team champions. I much preferred them being singles more than anything else. So the fact that they were going to drop the belts here didn't upset me at all. They tried to tease a little bit of issues or dissension, perhaps, between Rob Van Dam and Booker T here. Rob Van Dam came off the top rope with one of his RVD kicks. I think he was trying to hit Batista, but he missed and hit Booker T instead, allowing Batista to hit the Batista bomb and win the tag team titles for himself and Ric Flair. And we have brand new Raw Tag Team Champions. Now, right after this, after Booker T and RVD lost the belt, we go back to the stage and we've got SmackDown's fourth pick. So Paul Heyman selects the ball out of the raw pool, and it turns out to be none other than Rob Van Dam, the guy that just had the match. So I think they probably go to commercial or something like that. We come back, we're backstage, we see RVD and Booker T talking about the loss. RVD at this point does not know he's been drafted. So him and Booker are kind of talking about dusting themselves off. Booker T doesn't even seem to be that upset with Rob for the miscue in the ring and getting kicked in the head. Even said, don't worry, shake it off. Accidents happen. It was an accident. We'll get our titles back. We'll go to Bischoff or whatever and try to get a rematch. And that's when they are approached by Jonathan Coachman, who informs them that Rob Van Dam has just been drafted to SmackDown. And Rob Van Dam does not seem happy about that at all. And that's the end of that tag team, at least temporarily. Up next, we had the World Heavyweight title match 
World Heavyweight Champion Chris Benoit defending against hometown boy Rhino. Benoit got an amazing ovation here from Hockey Town. Detroit really stood up and cheered hard for him. I love to see that. They barely batted an eye when hometown boy Rhino came out. Even when he was coming to the ring, I think Lillian, I think she was the announcer, and she's like from Detroit, Michigan, and the crowd barely got like a little golf clap for Rhino. I found that to be pretty funny where Benoit, they popped hard for him when he came out. This was a pretty good match. As Bischoff said when he drafted Rhino, he goes, you know, if there's one person that can actually stand toe-to-toe with Benoit in terms of intensity, Rhino might be the guy to do it. So he gave Benoit a pretty good match, you know, nothing crazy. And uh, Benoit wound up tapping him out with the crossface. No surprise there. Benoit ain't dropping the belt to Rhino eight days after he won it. So not a real huge surprise with that match there. Not that much to talk about, but good. You know, this is a former ECW champion and former WCW champion and now world heavyweight champion in the ring together. So pretty cool match, I guess, on paper. But in the end, Benoit, of course, because he's the champ, taps Rhino out. During that match, we cut backstage to, or after the match, we cut backstage to Bischoff, who was watching that match on the monitor. And that's when he's approached by Shawn Michaels. And Shawn Michaels, of course, has had, has been having his issues with Triple H for a long time. They were part of the triple threat match at WrestleMania. And he tells Eric that even though he wants a shot at Benoit and he wants to focus on getting the belt, the world title back at some point, his bigger issue is his feud with Triple H and the issue between them is not over yet. And since Triple H has been traded to SmackDown, he begs Eric Bischoff to trade him to SmackDown. So do whatever you have to do, trade me to SmackDown. Which one of the things that I should have mentioned when we talked about Vince with Heyman and Bischoff, one of the rules that Vince laid out that I didn't say earlier and I should have was that they, after the six picks each are made, they can trade and do whatever they want. They have free reign to trade anybody they want. If they don't like their picks, they can do anything. The only catch is they have to do it prior to midnight that night, according to Vince's rules or whatever. So Sean is telling Eric to please trade him to SmackDown so he can be on the same show as Triple H so he can continue feuding with him. But then Bischoff, realizing that he just lost his biggest star, Triple H, he can't lose, he can't afford to lose Sean too. So he decides to, he tells Sean, he goes, look, I can't trade you to SmackDown. I'm not trading you to SmackDown. But what I will do is I'm going to be completely behind you. I'm going to give you every opportunity and I'm going to do whatever you want. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you a shot against Chris Benoit for the world heavyweight title at Backlash. And then Sean's like, you know what? That will work because I might not be able to directly get my revenge on Triple H and get my hands on him, but it would be pretty awesome to win the one thing in the world that means the most to Triple H, and that, of course, is the world heavyweight title. So he agrees, and cooler heads prevailed there, so he didn't have to super kick Bischoff's head off in order to get him to trade him to SmackDown. Shawn Michaels will remain on Raw. After that, we get Raw's fourth pick. Eric Bischoff selects Tajiri from the SmackDown pool, so Tajiri will now be making his way over to Monday Night Raw, and then we would get SmackDown's fifth pick. And like they said, everybody is eligible here. And the man that SmackDown picked for Monday Night Raw was Teddy Long. Teddy Long, I think, was managing at the time. He was managing Jazz and I think maybe Rodney Mack. So we just recently talked about that. I think they're still together or something. Rodney Mack and Jazz, that is incredible. We talked about that in the uh, Royal Rumble 2002 review that we uh, or watch along that we did the other night. So Teddy Long is now over to SmackDown, and that was the beginning of it, right? Because then Teddy would be there for a little while. He would eventually be plugged in into the GM role where he would be legendary, a legendary SmackDown GM. And that was uh, this that all started right here when he was sent to SmackDown for the first time. After that, we get Raw's fifth pick. Eric Bischoff pulls the ball out of the bin and he's like, all right, this is great. This guy's on injured reserve right now. But when he comes back, he's going to be a part of the Raw roster. Monday Night Raw is pleased to welcome Edge to the brand. So Edge, who had been out for a year prior to WrestleMania 19, he missed 19 and 20 because he got injured right before WrestleMania and then was out for the year. So they announced that when Edge does come back, he will be on the Raw brand. After that, we get the final two picks for Raw and SmackDown. SmackDown's sixth pick turns out to be the man who wrestled earlier on, Spike Dudley. So again, not really earth shattering names here. No huge names. Triple H is really the only big name and edge, I suppose, that were picked in this draft. Everybody else was just, you know, interchangeable mid-card people. It was kind of weird that they made such a big deal about this. And that would leave us with Raw's final pick. Things would start to look up for Eric Bischoff here because he may have lost Triple H, but he just gained a huge name. 
He pulled the ball out of the bin, opened it up, read it, seems to be in disbelief. Heyman is demanding to know who it is. And Bischoff's like, well, as Vince said in the beginning of the show, everybody is eligible. Everybody is eligible to be drafted. There are no exemptions. There are no exceptions. Monday Night Raw is pleased to welcome its newest member of the roster, Paul Heyman. Heyman shits his pants in complete disbelief that he's now been drafted to Raw, and I guess that means he's supposed to have to work for Eric Bischoff or something. He absolutely refuses because Bischoff says, you know what, it's a good thing you're here because I could use some extra work around here, get my tires rotated and clean my car, and we got a lot of maintenance that needs to be done. Basically says that he's going to treat Paul Heyman like a complete servant, like a butler, like Charles on AEW uh, Dynamite. And Heyman is like, I don't think so. Fuck you. I quit. And quits right there on the stage and leaves, storms out of the building, right into a, a running limo and a waiting limo, and off Heyman goes. So Heyman is gone just like that. Bischoff winds up walking to the ring, and he's gloating, and he's so happy. And that's when you hear Edge's music play. Doesn't say anything, just gets right in the ring with Eric Bischoff and immediately gives him a spear and kind of celebrates with the audience. And Edge looked jacked when he came back. Edge coming back was a big deal. I had missed him a lot, and it sucked that he missed two WrestleManias. What was also interesting about this is that his music, his Rob Zombie theme, was dubbed over here with his old school Edge theme. But just the other night, on my channel, we watched, did a watch along of the 2002 Royal Rumble. He also had the Rob Zombie theme back then, and they played it on the pay-per-view. So I don't know why the theme music and the dubbing on the WWE Network is so all over the place. You'd think if they weren't going to use the Rob Zombie song, they wouldn't use it anywhere instead of picking and choosing. So I don't know what the rules are of why sometimes it's not dubbed on the network. I know The Undertaker has this issue a lot too with Kid Rock and Limp Biscuit. Sometimes it's on the network, sometimes it's not. And so this was really weird that I was watching this the night after I did a watch along where you could hear the Rob Zombie theme. So when when Bischoff, or I'm sorry, when uh, Edge was coming out to the ring here, you can tell, you can tell when you're listening to it that the music doesn't sound right. So I looked up the original clip on YouTube and actually I have this Money Night Raw recorded right off of Spike TV in my own collection, but it was easier to go on YouTube and find it. And sure enough, you hear the Rob Zombie theme, but on the network, you hear the old school Edge theme. It's so weird. I never understand what the rules are with the music and why it's so damn wishy-washy. But anyway, that wraps it up for all of the Raw and SmackDown picks, leaving us just with the big WWE title match to close the show, the main event, WWE champion Eddie Guerrero defending against Triple H. So Triple H has a chance here to win the WWE title. You would think that would be just as important to him as winning the World Heavyweight title, especially since the World Heavyweight title was just created out of thin air two years prior. So he's got a big opportunity here. And just to see these two in the ring together was pretty cool. Triple H makes his way to the ring first, coming out there in his raw shirt. And then he tears off the raw shirt to reveal the SmackDown shirt. We've got Michael Cole and Taz, the SmackDown announcers on call for this thing. And then Eddie comes out in his awesome souped up low rider. It's one of the ones that bounces up in the air with the hydraulics and everything. And he's got that fucking car completely on its side. Crowd going nuts for him. I love and miss Eddie Guerrero so much. Gets out of the car with the belt and does the shimmy and everything. My God, how much we all loved Eddie Guerrero. Damn. So cool to see how just stupidly, ridiculously talented and athletic Eddie Guerrero was, how crisp he was, how crisp his mannerisms and his movements were. He hit about halfway through the match here, just an absolutely picture-perfect, beautiful standing dropkick right to the mush of Triple H. All of the classic Eddie Guerrero moves, the three amigo suplexes. Evolution wound up hitting the ring. Batista and Ric Flair came out, and around this time, they actually switched over the audio on the commentary to the Raw team, to Jerry Lawler and Jim Ross. So you had Cole and Taz calling the match, but then when Flair and Batista came out there, now all of a sudden, Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler are calling the match. It was really kind of confusing there, but Evolution came out, of course, to try to help Triple H. Batista grabs the WWE title and hands it to Triple H so he can use it on Eddie, but that's when Rey Mysterio and John Cena then hit the ring to attack Batista, and he got this big brawl between Evolution, Cena, and Mysterio on the outside of the ring. Triple H goes to hit Eddie Guerrero with the belt, but Shawn Michaels comes in from behind, sweet chin music to Triple H's face, and then dives over the top rope 
onto the brawl, onto Evolution on the outside of the ring. Eddie Guerrero goes up to the top to go for the frog splash, but then Christian appears out of nowhere and grabs his foot and tries to stop him. And then the referee calls for the bell and it turns out to be a disqualification. But I would have loved if Sean would have just super kicked Triple H right there. Eddie hit him with the frog splash and pinned him. That would have been great. This is probably a little bit of Triple H not wanting to do jobs and shit. Who knows? But I think that would have been a great finish to Monday Night Raw to have Eddie beat him there. But instead, it's a big disqualification. RVD and the entire Raw locker room empty out. Raw and SmackDown locker rooms both empty out. Even Austin comes out with his four-wheeler and leads even more troops out to the ring to where you wind up having just this big red, white, and blue smoothie, like I said. 100 guys out there all battling, really cool visual, especially the wide shot of the ring, of everybody in the ring and outside the ring, just brawling with each other and fighting. Very cool, exciting way to close Monday Night Raw. And I loved, I've always loved big brawl endings to Raw, especially prior to a Royal Rumble or a big pay-per-view or something like that. So this is a really great way, I think, to close off the draft lottery. And uh, it was fun. It was a lot of fun, this entire show from top to bottom here. And I was, like I said earlier, I was curious about how they were going to get out of this situation with Triple H, because we know Triple H would not go to SmackDown. He would stay on Raw. So that's when I DM'd Barry last night. And I was like, Barry, refresh my memory. I know Triple H gets back to Raw, but how does he do it? And I guess what happens is on the very next SmackDown, that's when they name Kurt Angle as the new SmackDown general manager. And he does a trade. I think he trades Triple H for... Booker T and the Dudley boys. So now you got the Dudleys and Booker T on SmackDown. Booker T can be reunited with Rob Van Dam, who also got drafted over there, and the Dudley boys. And again, you guys help me out with my memory in the comments here. Why was Kurt Angle the general manager? I guess he was injured, or maybe he was taking time time off for injury after WrestleMania 20, after he lost to Eddie, and then he's the GM. Would Heyman be back? Like, what would Heyman do after this? Was he done, or would he come back to TV as well? I think he would come back to TV because he has revenge to get on The Undertaker and stuff, and I'm pretty sure he was involved in that whole deal, that debacle with Paul Bear and the cement truck and all of that. You guys help me out with that. Let me know what the hell that was all about. But 2004 was an interesting year, and I'd be more than willing and uh, happy to review more shows from this year because this one was great. Like I said, they crammed. It just blows my mind how much they could cram into a two-hour show. Even during the Attitude Era, 1997 and 1998, 1999, it would feel like so much happened on a Raw, where now you watch a three-hour Raw and literally nothing happens. Like maybe one or two important things, maybe a good match happened and then a, a title match was set up on a pay-per-view or something like that. But really, you can go three hours with a whole lot of nothing these days on Monday Night Raw. And this episode gave you anything but. Like I said, the fact that both shows had six picks each, I thought they were a little weak. You know, we only had Triple H and... Paul Heyman as the big, you know, uh, whopping surprises, but even those wouldn't stick because Triple H would go back to Raw, and then Paul Heyman, I think, would find his way back into SmackDown at some point somehow. So every other draft pick was kind of useless. So, and also, I don't know if they did any additional trades that night, like Vince said in the beginning of the show, both guys could trade anybody they wanted prior, provided they did it prior to midnight that night. And I know the Triple H trade would come a couple of days after that. So not sure how all of that works into this either. So anyway, this one was a lot of fun. Barry, I want to thank you once again for your awesome support here on the channel. I had a really good time looking back at this show. Every time you have donated to have a review done, I've always been excited to watch the show again because most of the time I haven't seen the show you're requesting since it happened. And this one was no different. Really interesting to look at this one again. And I loved it. And we're going to do a lot of great things uh, this year heading into WrestleMania. We're going to do a lot of great watch alongs, a lot of trips down memory lane as we look back at different years and various time periods throughout the WWE. So I fully plan on keeping this going and uh, hopefully we'll have more shows like this to review in the future. It should be a really fun WrestleMania season here on the channel. I hope you guys all subscribe. Please do if you have not yet already. So that's going to wrap it up for this review. I want to thank you guys once again for listening and uh, taking this trip down memory lane with us. And also thanks, big thanks again to Barry MK for yet another awesome sponsored review. This was a blast. You guys take care of yourselves. Have a great rest of your night. Very happy birthday to you. And I will catch you all in the next one. Y'all be good. Peace. Yeah.